And I think the only thing that needs to be changed about that song, the old, old story, it's 100% it's true except for one little part. And it's not that some have never heard, but the fact is most have never heard the name of Jesus. Most people in the world have not heard the name of Jesus Christ. Even though they've heard of Coca-Cola or Apple Computer, they've not heard the name of Christ. He is the central point of the Bible. Jesus is. He is the central point of all history. Have you noticed that this is the year 2012? Where did we get that number? We got it from the birth of Jesus Christ. And even in Muslim countries, the year is 2012. He is the central point of all life, of all history, of all the universe. And we come to his story this morning in Mark chapter 3, rather. Mark chapter 3. The subject, the greatest subject of all time is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the most, most contested and controversial figure in the world, even today. He has been the most understood person in all the world, in all of history. Many, many opinions still circulate about exactly who he is. But the fact of the matter is, you could get the identity of anyone in the world wrong and still be okay except for Him. If you get the identity of Jesus wrong, if you think He is someone that He is in fact not, that's an eternal uh, mistake. We must keep that in mind. And as we read these verses, I want to suggest to you that we, we often forget that Jesus said that any number of sins could be forgiven, but He made one exception. There is literally one sin that will not be forgiven and cannot be forgiven. And that is what we're going to talk about today. Even though His mercy is great, there's one thing that He cannot forgive. And that's our subject. Verse 20 in Mark chapter 3. The story of Jesus Christ. Verse 20. And He came home... And the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not even eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him. For they were saying, he has lost his senses. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. And he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man. And then he will plunder his house. Verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men. And whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Because they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Verse 31, then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside they sent word to him, and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. A lot of powerful words to talk about this morning. A lot to unpack. And I want to begin back at chapter, uh, verse 20, I should say. Verse 20. And what I want to call this first part, 
actually the whole section, the rest of chapter 3, you could call it the different faces of unbelief. Unbelief can take many, many different forms. In the first part, you have the crowd and his own people. In the second part, verse 26, you've got the Pharisees and the scribes. And then in verse 31, you have his family once again. So verse 20, he came home and the crowd gathered again. Once again, he was in someone's house. He was not necessarily in his house. We know that he was not, uh, he did not have a permanent address. He just stayed wherever he could. He was at a house. The crowd gathered again to such an extent they could not even eat a meal. This is probably the high point of his popularity. You know the popularity in the region had grown. More and more people were hearing about the miracles and about the wonders and the signs and the healings. That's very important to keep in mind as we go down these verses today. All the news about all he had done had spread about the whole region. He had dozens of eyewitnesses of healing the sick, completely curing leprosy, causing blindness to disappear into sight, and even raising the dead. People had seen this. They could not dispute that he was a work, wonder-working man. And so the crowds were at a fever pitch, and there were so many people in that place, they couldn't even get a break to eat a meal. And verse 21 shows us the first face of unbelief. When his own people heard of this, we could translate that his kinsmen, his extended family. When his extended family heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying he has lost his senses. Now they were there to take custody of him. That word could be translated the word seize. They were trying to take him by force because they said he has lost his senses. Now keep in mind the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about his family. Of course, he is a grown man. His mother is a believer, Mary. His father, his stepfather, I should say, Joseph, not even mentioned. Most scholars would believe that Joseph has passed away by this point of the story. <coughs> but there are other members of his family. Jesus had brothers like James and Jude who apparently were not believing in him. Now Mary believed that he was the anointed one. Mary believed that her son was the Christ. How did she know? Because the angel himself told her, right? You will be with child and he will be great. He will be the son of the most high. That's the Christmas story. She knew from heaven itself. From the testimony of the angel. And so there are other parts of the family. Perhaps uncles, cousins, brothers certainly. That did not understand who he was. All of these things he was doing. All of these things he was saying. And as you well know, he claimed to be God. They had no category for that in their mind. I mean, have you ever had a perfect brother? Is there a such thing as a perfect brother, folks? Mothers, you may, have, you may think you have a perfect child, but then after you get home from the hospital, you may change your mind. Mary literally had a perfect child. You know, as I've said before, can you imagine Mary talking to someone else? Hey, Mary, how's your son Jesus doing? How is he this week? He's perfect. Literally, he is perfect. Everything he said, every comment he made was divine. Every little quip he said in the house at the carpenter's bench was literally perfect and righteous. And so his own family, this is very astounding, those who spent the most time with him when he grew up, his own family did not understand who he was. And so they were trying to seize him. They said, he has lost his senses. That word literally means he is standing beside himself. You ever said that about someone? Oh, he's just beside himself. That's exactly what they're saying about Jesus. This phrase is exactly the same words. He is just beside himself. I don't know what he has gotten into, but I don't understand at all what's going on with him. So they're trying to seize him. Maybe to save him from more embarrassment, they thought. 
But the Bible simply calls that unbelief. Unbelief. Now, what do we know about his brothers? We know that later on, James, I know, for example, and Jude, the brother of Jesus, both became believers. In fact, Jude was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. So they had a change of heart. But at this point of the story, it was unbelief. It was confusion. They didn't know what to make of him. But at least it wasn't as bad as what the scribes said. Verse 22. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying. Now I want to just pause there a minute. Keep that in mind. Were saying. We have to understand that this is something that they had been thinking and talking about for a very long time. This was a continued statement of him. They were saying what? He is possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. That was their assessment of Jesus Christ. And that verb tells us that they were not just slipping into some mistake. They didn't just have a bad day. They didn't just stub their, stub their toe and say, oh, Jesus has got a demon. This was a settled commitment in their heart that they had been talking about from the time of being in Jerusalem. So the scribes, that is, the, 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 the ones who would know the Scripture the best, the ones who would supposedly know the mind of God the most, had come to a conclusion about Jesus Christ. Now there's one thing they could not do. They could not say he's a charlatan because he had already cast out many demons, healed many people, even raised the dead. That fact was settled. They could not deny his miracles. They knew that he had done many supernatural things. And so the only conclusion they could come up with is, a, is a, an enormously illogical, nonsensical conclusion. They said, yes, he's casting out demons by the power of Satan. He casts out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And they said he is possessed, possessed by Beelzebul. That was their conclusion. As smart as they thought they were, as together as they should have had it with the Scripture, their conclusion was, the only way He's doing this, since we know it's real, it's real miracles, the only way He's doing this is by the power of <coughs> Satan. By El Beelzebul. <coughs> the word Beelzebul is very interesting. Um, the original word, well, I should say B-A-A-L, the word Baal, simply means a a Babylonian god. It was a Babylonian deity. And this name got changed, and the word Baal means Lord. It just means Lord or God. And so they came up with the word Baalzebub, ending with a B. And that word in, in Babylonian meant the Lord of a high place. The Lord of a high place. So this was the, the highest God in their pantheon in, in Babylon. Well, the Jews being so opposed to idolatry actually took this word Beelzebub and changed the last letter to an L, which completely changed the meaning of the word in order to make fun of this God which was mute and non-existent. The word Beelzebub means Lord of a high place, the word Beelzebul means the Lord of the dung. Or it could be translated Lord of the Flies. You ever heard of that phrase, Lord of the Flies? There's a book written called Lord of the Flies. And so it had a sense of absolute disdain. In other words, their God is the lowest of the low. He is the Lord over the dung and the flies and the most filthy thing you could imagine. So that was their word for Satan. So imagine what Jesus thought when they said of him, he is possessed by Beelzebul. In other words, Jesus is the Lord of the dumb, is what they were saying. Looking at the miracles, looking at the wonders, listening to his words, their conclusion was he is God of the dumb. That's what Jesus is worth. 
Wow. What a, what a commitment they had already made. That's, that's a bad place to be, by the way, if you didn't get, gather that already. And so verse 23, he could have gotten very angry, of course. I think he was more concerned than anything. He called them to himself. In other words, he brought them closer. You know, he'd not heard them say this. He just knew their thoughts, even from afar. He called them to himself and, and began speaking to them in parables. And the word parable simply means an illustration or a saying or a comparison. It's like saying the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's comparing one thing to another. And so he's trying to speak on their level. He's trying to get down to their level and, and speak in a way that they could really understand in parables. And he says to them something that just makes perfect sense. He says, folks, how? Can Satan cast out <laughs> Satan? It's a very simple, logical way of, of getting to their point, isn't it? How in the world could Satan, who has been infiltrating this world and possessing <laughs> these people for years, how could Satan suddenly come along and undo all his work? That is nonsense. That is nonsense. Which, of course, is Jesus' assessment of their line of thinking, isn't it? Unbelief will not only make you do crazy things, it'll make you think crazy things. Illogical things. And so he says, how can Satan cast out Satan? Verse 24, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a kingdom has a king... And that king is calling all of his troops and military might to attack his own kingdom. What's going to happen? That kingdom's going to fall. That kingdom is going to go to the ground. It is foolishness. It is shooting your own men. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You will lose the battle within minutes. And he says, if a house is divided against itself... That house will not be able to stand. If a father is committed to the, to the detriment of the children, and the child is committed to tearing down the parents and destroying the parents, what is going to happen to that household? It's going to go down. It is foolish to fight against yourself. That's what Jesus is saying. And, verse 26, part 3 of his parable, if, if Satan has risen up against himself... And is divided, he cannot stand and he's finished. Is Satan going to take his weaponry and shoot himself over and over and over again? What does that say about Satan and the kingdom of darkness? It cannot stand. It would be like a man going out into the in, in a boat into the deep lake, in the middle of a lake, and instead of fishing, he's got a gun and he's shooting holes in the boat. What's going to happen? You're going to go down. You're going to go down. Nobody would do this, Jesus is saying. How in the world, he says to the scribes, how in the world would you possibly come up with a conclusion that I'm operating under the power of Satan? You know, have you not seen what I've been doing? I've been tearing down this satanic uh, attack, this satanic corruption, this satanic uh, taking over and this demonic oppression and this possession, how could I be doing it by Satan's power? He says it's nonsense. He gives a second illustration in verse 27. And I want you to follow with me because many people have misunderstood verse 27 and try to apply it to something they're doing in the modern world. And that's not at all what Jesus means. Verse 27 but no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Now let's talk about what this means. It's very simple. The strong man is Satan, the, the ruler of the evil kingdom. The strong man is the one that has bound people with oppression for years. That's the strong man. 
So what do you think the strong man's house is talking about? It is his domain, his reign, his rulership. What Satan has been ruling over for so many years, and people just thought it was the status quo until no one, the words no one, no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property, the property being those under the control of Satan, the demon-possessed, the oppressed, the blind, the diseased, the lepers, those under Satan's domain. No one can enter the strong man's house and plunder, take back his property, unless, okay, unless he first binds the strong man. Now, he is talking about Jesus, isn't it? If there's a strong man holding all these people in captivity, the only way to defeat this strong man is by a stronger man. And that's Jesus. He's talking about himself. Binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. What does that mean? Take possession of what previously belonged to Satan, the strong man, and take them for himself. He's talking about people, isn't he? People who were previously under the domain and the oppression of Satan. Jesus says the stronger man has come. And he has tied up the strong man, or Satan, and he has taken away his property. That makes sense. If, if the stronger man, being Jesus, overpowers Satan, that makes sense. But Satan overpowering himself, Satan taking control of what Satan already has, none of that makes any sense. But that was the conclusion that the scribes had made. And so Jesus came, as I've mentioned before, He came into the world, He erased disease out of Israel. I mean, there was no oppression, there was no demon possession left by the time Jesus arrived. And so Jesus is that stronger man. He is that stronger man. And we have all the way ahead in the Bible, in Revelation 20, an even greater description of when Satan will be bound for a thousand years. Who could do that? Not Satan binding himself, but the stronger one. The Lord Jesus Christ. Not Lord of the flies. Lord of all creation. Lord of all creation. Even Satan himself. Now Jesus is saying here, more than just, you scribes are mistaken. You scribes have made an, an error, a lapse in judgment, an occasional lapse in judgment. He says that what they're doing is actually quite serious. And that's what verse 28 is all about. You've got to keep in mind the context. They had just declared that Jesus is actually Satan. That's what they said. Look at what Jesus says about that. Verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men. And whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And verse 30 tells us a lot more about it, very importantly, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now I hope to clear this up today. It's very possible that you being a believer in Christ have encountered someone in your life at one time or another who has either warned you or told you that you may have committed the unforgivable sin. We also call it the unpardonable sin. You've heard of the unpardonable sin, haven't you? There's a lot of different people, a lot of different opinions about exactly <laughs> what that is. Some people will say, if you even utter the words, Jesus is cursed, like I just did, you're automatically committing the unpardonable sin. And you will never have forgiveness. You've just erased your salvation. Other people say, if you do this or you do that, you've committed the unpardonable sin. Or, you know, if, if you... If you curse and don't ask forgiveness if you miss something you've done 
and asking forgiveness for that thing, they say that's the unpardonable sin. None of those are the case. What is the context here? Why did Jesus say that here and not in other parts of the Scripture? For example, He never said about the woman at the well who had had adulterous relationship after relationship, He never said, you've committed the unpardonable sin. Nor did He say to a divorced person, you've committed the unpardonable sin. Even though many people think divorce is the unpardonable sin. It is not. There is one unforgivable sin, and Jesus describes it right here. Back to verse 28. All sins shall be given, that is all nature, all manner of sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and even this, he says, whatever blasphemies they utter. What's the word blasphemy mean? It means to speak harmful of. It means to degrade. It means to curse with your mouth, with your words. He even says that anyone who blasphemes the Son of Man, Jesus, can be forgiven. Now, that's true, isn't it? I'll give you an example. The Apostle Paul, at the beginning of 1 Timothy, in chapter 1, says, Even though I was a blasphemer, I was shown mercy. That's true, isn't it? Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was known as Saul, blasphemed Jesus Christ repeatedly by trying to kill his people called the church. So former blasphemers can be forgiven unless, verse 29, they're blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Have you ever wondered if you've done that? Have you ever wondered, oh, what, did I ever do that? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Let me put it in frame, frame it this way. The Holy Spirit of God has one main purpose. One main purpose as far as this world. And that is to point to Jesus Christ. He does it for the unbeliever by convicting them of their sin and of the judgment to come. He does it by co convincing them of who Jesus is. He does it in the believer by reminding us of who Jesus is. And reminding us of what Jesus said, right? That's what John 14 and John 16 is talking about. He convinces us and reminds us about one person. Not himself, but the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is, is got the one main purpose of pointing people to the true identity of Jesus Christ. It happened at his baptism. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus in the form of a dove. God the Father said, this is my Son whom I love, listen to Him. And so all throughout even the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God was taking the words and the actions of Jesus and trying to convince people of who Jesus really is. That is the work of the Holy Spirit then and the work of the Holy Spirit now. Jesus did all His ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit to prove to the world who He truly was. The Pharisees had seen it. The scribes had experienced it firsthand. They had known the touch and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is attributing the work of God to the work of Satan. It is saying that all these things that God is doing is really Satan at work. And again, this is not, okay, lest you be afraid, this is not just saying certain words. This was a settled commitment, a convinced commitment in the minds of the scribes after weighing all the evidence, after seeing all the miracles, they were saying, okay, we can't deny the miracles, but we can't say he's from God. Therefore, he is of Satan. Once you do that, once you've been touched, once you've got the facts, once you've got the reality of who Jesus is in front of your face, and you, in your mind and heart, say and believe he is of Satan, that is the sin which is unforgivable. Why is it unforgivable? Because God is done with you. 
You will never ask forgiveness because you'll never think to ask forgiveness. Those who have gone that far into enemy territory, <laughs> attributing the work of Satan, of, of the Holy Spirit to Satan, those who have gone that far into the water cannot be forgiven because they will never want to be forgiven. They will never think to be forgiven. Let me give you another biblical example of that. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And I'm thankful we only have 10 minutes or so because I really could get into this big time. If you're thinking, is that that verse I'm thinking about? Yes, that is that verse you're thinking about. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 4. Yes, this is that passage. I'm only going to touch on it. And I want to make this an example of what the scribes actually did. Okay? And of course, I'm going to give you my take on what this verse is talking about. Hebrews 6, verse 4. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. Now let's think about that a minute. Think about that in terms of the scribes. That is exactly what they were thinking. That is exactly what happened to them. Okay? I'll say a brief word about those who think this verse means you can lose your salvation. If this means you can lose your salvation, it also teaches that you can never get it back again. That once you've lost it, it's gone forever. And I don't believe anyone would really say that who thinks you could lose your salvation. So what is he talking about? Well, he's either talking about Christians or non-Christians. Okay? Let's read it again. In the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. You see those words? I would suggest to you that none of those words suggest a really saved person. Tasted, played with, toyed with, enlightened. Enlightened is not a word that necessarily means someone that's all the way into Christ. So let me just summarize briefly. This seems to be talking about people who are under the influence of the Holy Spirit, of the Gospel, and the people of God, but have not yet made that step into Jesus Christ. And he's saying this. That helps it make sense, doesn't it? People who are close to the kingdom, but not quite there yet, are the enlightened. <coughs> They're tasting of the heavenly gift. They're hearing the Gospel. They're rubbing noses with Christians. They're hanging around the church. Okay? Partakers of the Holy Spirit. They are experiencing some of the workings and the evidences of the Holy Spirit. I can think back of my pre-conversion life of this very thing happening. I saw the Spirit working in them and them and them and them. And I didn't even know He was working in me. It was unseen, but He was. Enlightened, taste of the heavenly gift, made partakers of the Holy Spirit, taste of the good word. You see, come under the hearing of the words of God and the powers of the age to come, have seen and experienced what God is doing in their midst. And then verse 6, and then have fallen away. That is not talking about repudiating a commitment to Christ that you've already made. It's talking about shrinking back from making that commitment. And that's what it's talking about in verse, verse um, I think it's verse, uh, verse 9 and 10. 
those who shrink back. But think about those scribes. Based on that Hebrews 6. Think about That's a perfect example of what was happening to them. They were in the midst of Israel. While Jesus was around. While Jesus was ministering. They saw it. Multiple times. They heard about it. Multiple times. They knew. They were miraculous things. They were immersed, so to speak. And surrounded by people who had been changed. By the power of this man, Jesus Christ. It was the Holy Spirit at work trying to point to Christ. Showing men who he was. And their decision was, all this stuff is Satan. All this stuff is Satan at work. That's why Jesus says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. But is guilty of an eternal sin. Because... Because, here it is, he was, they were saying he has an unclean spirit. They were saying he has an unclean spirit. So unless you're convinced in your mind that Jesus Christ is Satan incarnate, you've not committed the unpardonable sin. In fact, I would go a little farther than that. I would say if you're worried about whether you've committed the unforgivable sin or not, you probably haven't. It's the people who never worry about it that may have. It's the ones who are past forgiveness. It, it, it's the ones that are past the point of no return. The application to this is obvious. You can hang out with Christians your whole life, but until you make that commitment to Jesus Christ, you are unforgiven. And in fact, if you spend your life in the company of believers doing certain spiritual things, if you've hobnobbed with the church and then you fall away and repudiate Jesus Christ, it would actually be worse for you than if you'd grown up in a brothel and then you find Christ. Because as Jesus says, if you've, if you've been around all that stuff and you reject it, if you come to the settled conclusion that Jesus is worth nothing, that He is the Lord of the dung pile, Jesus says there is no forgiveness left. You've crossed the line. You've crossed the point of no return. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, well, what about my family members that aren't here right now? I can't answer for them. But it's your responsibility to go to them and say, what do you think of Jesus Christ? Either he is Lord or he's not. If he's Lord, you have to be here. Period. If he's Satan, there's no forgiveness. But if he is their Savior and their Lord, that means they're a slave of his. And they need to not be playing these church games anymore. So I can't answer for your, your family member whether they've crossed this line or not. All I do know is if there's a settled final commitment in their heart that Jesus is worthless and Jesus is satanic, then there is no forgiveness. But up to that point, Jesus said all manner of sin can be forgiven. Even blasphemy against the Son of God. Because they said He was an unclean spirit. They had no forgiveness. Let's finish out this chapter. Again, another face of unbelief. Verse 31. His mother and brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd is sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Very, very simple, common thing to say. Jesus is here teaching. His family members are outside. He could just let them in, you know. He could just stop what he's doing and go see them. I mean, that sounds logical, normal, right? This is what he did. He took this moment and has always made it into a teaching, discipling moment. Answering them, he said, who, who are my mother and my brothers? And surely they took him literally, right? Can you imagine their shocked look on their face? What do you mean? Who are your mother and your brothers? We just said they're here. We just told you they're here. Are you deaf? Jesus was going way deeper than them, though, wasn't he? Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who are sitting around him, we could call, we could, we could 
put an underline there and, and say the disciples, those who were following him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. What is the point of this? It, it's very simple. It's that the blood of Christ is much thicker than family blood. Blood is thicker than water, but Christ's blood is thicker than everything. Christ even said, He came not to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a daughter against her mother, and a brother against a brother. Jesus Christ is Lord of all things, and He works in such a way that He often cuts right in the middle of families. None of you have to have me explain this, because you understand. You understand with a heavy heart that there are some people in your family that are following Christ, and there are some that are not. That's the case with me and my family, my extended family. Jesus said, if you're going to follow Him, as much as you love your family, as much as you're connected to your family, as much as you want to have your identity in that last name, He said, your real identity is in me, child. It is in me. And He said, if you're willing to go all the way with Jesus, with me, even forsaking your family, if, it, if needs be, you will not fail to receive even a hundred times the reward in the age to come. I will never forget. Every time I read this verse, I always remember the same thing. This was astounding to me. And you may remember this. Debating whether or not we should come home from the mission field or stay and, and keep working in Southeast Asia. I remember reading this verse, sitting in a large convention room with missionaries from all over Southeast Asia, from Indonesia all the way up to Myanmar, sitting in this room in Chiang Mai, Thailand, every one of them having committed to leaving home and farm and family to spread the gospel. And I'll never forget how Libby Panter talked about how this is her real, her new family. And that verse immediately came to mind. Who is my family? It's these people here in Chiang Mai who have lost everything to follow Christ. Here is my mother and my brothers and my sisters right here in Thailand spreading the gospel. Jesus Christ is well deserving of all, isn't He? Think about all that we've learned about Him just today. He demands absolute commitment. If you get His identity wrong, there is no forgiveness. <coughs> And even his family <clears throat> misunderstood who he was. We have to get him right. We have to get his identity just right. Who is Jesus? Mark tells us. He is the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is Lord. He is Savior. And he is treasure of God. Is He your Savior today? Is He your Lord today? Is He your treasure today? If you still show an interest in Jesus, you are not committing the eternal, unforgivable sin. There is still room at the cross for everybody who wants forgiveness. For everybody who wants to go to heaven. For everybody who wants forgiveness. So if you want that forgiveness today and you don't know it yet, come to Christ. Come to Him. It may be that next week will be too late. It may be that by next week you've decided that Jesus is worthless. Why not do it today? Why not commit to Him as Savior today, as Lord today, and as treasure today? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for who Jesus is, the sum total of his identity.